Welcome to Beyond Imagination, the future of creative technology, presented by Technicolor Creative Studios. I'm your host, Isabel Duplessis, Global PR Director across the Mill, MPC, Micros Animation, and Technicolor Games. In this special edition podcast season, we'll be talking to leading figures across the creative technology space about evolving trends that are shaping the future of filmmaking, gaming, advertising, animation, innovation, and talent. In this episode, we're exploring the evolution of the advertising landscape, from the change in traditional creative pipelines to the growing appetite for media and how this is affecting how brands take their message to market. I'm joined by Executive Vice President and Global Director of Creative Production at The Mill, Angelo Ferruja, and Global Director of Growth at The Mill, Liz Pavett. Thank you both for joining me today. Let's kick off with some intros. First of all, tell me a bit about yourselves, your role at The Mill, and your background within the advertising space. Liz, let's kick off with you. Hi, Izzy. Thanks so much for having uh, myself and Angelo today. Um, So I've been in the industry for over 15 years. Um, I rose up through the ranks of viral video, uh, content production and influencer marketing in London, uh, then New York and LA, and then back to New York. Um, And I've recently joined the mill um, from a four year stint at Media Monks, where I witnessed unprecedented growth and am now leading our global growth initiative here at the mill out of New York. Exciting stuff. And Angelo, how about you? Well, I've uh, been in the business for uh, 25 plus years, a little long in the tooth, but I'd say I have um, pretty young at heart. Um, I started back at, back at Kirshenbaum and Bond, like when they were doing guerrilla marketing, um, made my way through the ranks of production, freelance at various different places, uh, obviously at one of, not obviously, but at some of the most award-winning um, premier uh, agencies like B2BDO, 72 and Sunny. And recently I've been over at um, EA running their creative production department. So I went to the client side, brand side, and help them build an internal creative production department for the past five years before joining the mill and helping to uh, redefine and rebuild the creative production um, arm here. So, yeah, I'm excited. It's good stuff. Well, you both have an incredibly rich background in marketing and advertising um, across agencies, brands, production companies. Um, Before we delve into the recent trends and and where the industry is going, let's review some of the more sweeping changes that have happened in the last five to 10 years. The print, broadcast and radio model of advertising has hugely evolved. What do you think are some of the biggest changes we've seen in the last few years? Liz, let's kick off with you. Okay, sure thing. Um, I think that yes, indeed, the traditional model is very much changing and evolving. And I think it's decentralizing. Um, Obviously, you used to have a certain set number of channels that you would market through. And now those are increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing. And so um, you, it, you, brands are having to work harder on um, where they are, well, how to find their audience and then how, where their audience are and then um, how, to, um, how to engage with them. Um, so very much um, spurred on by changing technology, um, gaming as well, obviously harking to and very much to Angelo's background. Um, and I guess um, accelerated also um, by the pandemic. Um, and, and these different channels and platforms um, all have their own specific Uh, feed and format driven content requirements. And so it's very much just not the 30 second spot anymore. Um, Sometimes you can tell your story and your narrative and as long as it takes to tell it, uh, you still have your 30, you still have your your 15s and sixes, et cetera. Um, But yeah, uh, uh, very much the amount of different channels and platforms that are available now um, is is incredible, uh, is daunting for um, some brands. um, But yeah, this is why uh, it, it really pays to 
can be able to communicate with your audience um, at the, the right place, uh, the right time, um, and with the right content. You touched on the proliferation of platforms available to distribute marketing content. How can brands know where to invest their marketing dollars? That must be uh, one of the huge challenges for them. What really should they be taking into account when they look at uh, reaching audiences across these platforms? Well, again, so we're very much in the ask, don't tell period of advertising. So it's, again, it's not like a 30 second spot where you just tell people how great the mouthwash is or whatever. It's, you know, audiences are becoming more impatient. Um, and with, again, with the advancement of mobile phones and the internet and technology and things. Um, but it really is key for a brand to understand, really understand their audience, understand where they are spending their time and how they're spending their time on all those different channels and platforms and then lean in and try and become part of that conversation again it's not about telling someone getting on to finding the right audience getting on that platform and then telling them something it, it is kind of very much kind of you know joining in with the crowd and earning that respect Angelo, you recently joined the mill from brand side. You were at EA for a long time. What do you think some of the biggest challenges that brands are facing today are when it comes to their advertising and marketing strategy? I think Liz hit upon it in the first question. I think that it's volume. I think that with all the emerging tech and all the new platforms out there, how do you stretch your marketing dollars? Um, you know, clients are you know brands have a finite amount of budgets that they need to allocate but we now have an exorbitant amount of platforms and ways to reach people so how do you do that um, and tell a story and and be able to make it a cohesive story with the same amount of thought and um and promise to deliver that's bespoke to each channel. So I really do believe it's a volume conversation right now that a lot of brands are having is how do we reach as many people as we can on all these different platforms in an organic way while we still um, have an, you know, a finite budget that we need to um, curate. So. Aside from the production side of things, do you think there has been any uh, big changes in the tonality of, of brand messaging um, in recent years and uh, creative changes um, in, in not necessarily how they're distributing that content, but what kind of conversations brands are looking to have? Yes, I definitely think so. I think that with the rise of TikTok, with in-channel marketing, like one would have on a platform like say Sony and or Xbox, versus how one would speak on Twitter. Um, yes, I think that the tonality has shifted and that you have to be authentic to that platform and that voice, but yet still having a, um, a, a master brand voice that is curated uniquely and authentically on those channels. And that to me also plays into how you execute. So the type of content that one would put on Twitter, static images from the data shows that static works well on Twitter. Videos don't. Um, something like TikTok, as we know that more live action, more organic handheld type content works better um, on TikTok versus say Instagram. So I think that it's really being uh, pointed to the platform of how those brands show up and the type of creator that shows up. You touched on something really interesting there, which is authenticity. And I think audiences or consumers these days are so much more savvy in the brands that they associate with and purchase from. And they are really holding brands accountable a lot more than they used to. And, and seeing through that authenticity when brands are potentially distributing messages that they don't um, wholly stand behind um, 
you know, uh, let's say behind the scenes. Would you say some of the major events that have happened throughout the pandemic has have also changed the um, creative angle that brands are taking when it comes to connecting with their audiences authentically and, and standing for social causes? Yeah, I think, look, authenticity, first off, is a real bugbear word of mine within the industry, and, and I, it's been bad around for a very long time it's kind of like somebody saying I'm really nice I'm really funny look at me and it's like are you really are you and do you do you really mean this and do you really mean this with every fiber of your being and the number of briefs that I've seen especially as you you know you go into social content and influencer and it's like oh we you know we need authentic ambassadors and we've got an authentic message and and I think that's where there's an incredibly fine line to tread and needing to work with kind of good, good kind of creatives who have a really, you know, good, good background in, um, in, in, in social voice as well, to be able to tread that fine line of the corporate messaging and translating that into something which is going to resonate really well with those with that audience exactly as i said earlier it's like though these audiences are um are becoming less patient as well and they can they can see through the bs and really to be able to say it mean it it's not just a one-time thing it is something that needs to be upheld in every single touch point every single piece of content right across a brand's digital ecosystem it's exactly you have to be authentic in your in your authenticity <laughs> or otherwise you can sniff right through it so you know it's a double entendre i'm a big believer in like brands have to remember that the people that we're talking to on the other you know on the other end of whatever channel or platform it is and and it it, it's just human psychology. It, it really is. It, it's like it's the base of, you know, whatever whatever new way, you know, whether it's you know creating a creating an NFT on the blockchain or you know uh, do, doing a virtual event or, or, or whatever or creating a, a fifteen second spot for, for YouTube. It's like you have to have that consistency of of tonality of message and um and and be true to yourself it's like if you're if you kind of deconstruct it and and you're like if who, who is your brand as a person right exactly. and therefore like who would their friends be who would their enemies be who well hopefully not enemies who what what would they read what where would they go for their news where would they go to buy their clothes where, where would they go out for lunch with their friends and things like that and it's building it up from that and so it's it's very much not just a turn up to a party and buy everyone drinks and feel like um, you're going to be lasting friends with people. Do you know what I mean? It's like you've got to walk through that door of the party and you've got to go and chat with everyone individually and make friends and hopefully they'll buy you a drink and then they will want to stay in touch with you. <laughs> hey, Liz, do you think, you know, obviously my experience on the client side was limited to just, you know, EA. Do you see, and, and I know that we did do this, um, but do you see other clients really pointing themselves and positioning themselves with a really clear master brand voice so that when we, you know, um, the mill execute upon it, we are being authentic to it, as well as having that insight in what that authenticity is on those channels to make that content. I'm just curious. I think in, in answer to your question, I think it's tricky. Um, I think that things tend to be, unless you're creating everything in one go, right? Unless everyone aligns at the same time on what the, you know, master brand tagline is, what the elevator, which is, you know, and how that then trickles down into all the different pieces of content that you're going to be creating right across your digital ecosystem. Digital ecosystem it Too becomes strong, tricky. Planning, yeah. yeah, it becomes tricky because there's, there are new platforms and channels that are coming out like TikTok. everybody jumped on that um 
you know, everybody's trying to jump on NFTs. And I heard an interesting stat yesterday, which is I think 15%, oh, sorry, was it only 50% of people between the ages of like 18 and 25 or something had ever heard of NFTs? So it's like brands are talking about it, but not everyone in the, <laughs> not everyone out there knows what they are. Um, and so I think, you know, the speed in which new channels and platforms are coming out and how brands are kind of rushing to try and adopt them means that there's going to be fragmented messaging. So I think it it's tricky because you kind of need that entire overhaul, right? Exactly. It needs to be, everything needs to be entirely overhauled and then future-proofed rather than trying to retrofit new channels and platforms into existing um, marketing messaging. Agree, which makes us as a stronger creative partner is if, the positioning and the master brand voice is very clear from the onset, then whether it's us or any other creator can actually use that as that launching point, knowing that volume and knowing that scale is infinite at this point, it really helps them be authentic when other, when content creators like ourselves are executing in their behalf. It's interesting. I think, you touched on something that I definitely saw during the, the rise of VR when brands were really interested in tapping into VR, that when there is a new platform available, everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon. And what they mustn't do, to your point, Liz, is shoehorn existing creative or uh, existing brand message that might not work or feel authentic on that platform into that platform just to say that they're a part of it. Because, you know, that's when you create content that falls flat and doesn't resonate. And I think there was definitely a habit for a while uh, of, of people saying, hey, we've just done this really cool ad. Can you put it in VR? And when you think about that, you go, well, who wants to watch an ad in VR? What's the point of that? What's the experience that you're offering? You know, Liz, you've you've often mentioned that everything needs to be audience led and uh, that there is an overhaul we need to do to not retrofit uh, perhaps more rigid brand messaging into the platforms that are available. I, I'd love to touch on TikTok for a second because Obviously, there was just a massive boom in TikTok during the pandemic. And we are used to working on large scale briefs, large scale productions, very involved uh, technological productions. But we are seeing this huge growing base of emerging content creators out there generating click, lo-fi and, and seemingly very authentic content that's going viral via TikTok. Do you think there are any key learnings perhaps people within our industry can can take from the likes of TikTok creators and influencers? Yeah, I, th I think that TikTok is one of the last bastions of promoting memetics and virality. Just the way in which, you know, it, there's got to be something about the asset. It's got to be something about the craft of how it was put together, the craft of the person who is who is in it, the the craft of the music that it's cut to. It, it, it's a very very different space um, where you have to think as a brand very hard um, about who you work with, what conversations you want to jump on board with, and again, it, it is easier to kind of work with an influencer who's already made a name for themselves than trying to launch something brand new on TikTok. I think it's the same as, it, you know, it's the age old um, kind of theory of memetics, I guess. Angelo, I don't know if you want to add anything. Well, I was just going to say, it's how do you cheat the algorithm? <laughs> yeah. You know, like at the end, it's really about cheating the algorithm on some of these platforms because that's what's going to get the most amount of views. So when you're coming from it, that perspective with the authenticity, then, you know, you're positioning yourself to be able to get the most amount of, you know, I hate saying the word, but reach, you know, which again, very marketing, but it, it does come down to the basic fundamentals that it is about reach. How do you get the most amount of reach? How do you get the most amount of viewership? And we think that there's this like huge, I don't know, um, Pan, not Pandora's box, but there's like this, this cheat code into it and the cheat code is just how do you game the algorithm so that you're served up over others 
And then that's where I think a lot of these influencers have done an amazing job because they've looked and they're saying what piece of music is trending. So they've done their research or, you know, what dance move or hashtag can I use to, you know, get to the top of the list or things like that. Um, so that that's what I, when I hear the word virality these days, I'm like, how are you gaining an algorithm to get the virality? Because it's really not that complicated if you do your homework. But that's yeah, me. it's really just about tapping into. It's being about. It's about being just so close to the the cultural heartbeat, as it were, and and having your ears and eyes to the ground. And exactly, I think that's where. Um, Oh, I hate to call myself a millennial, but I really am. That's where we can really learn from Gen Zs and, and the emerging talent coming out because uh, it's hard sometimes to speak to audiences if you're not a part of that audience and you're not tapped into that culture. Exactly. And that's really, really important. 100%. And that, again, goes back to the word authenticity. It's like if you're if you're trying to show up at... Coachella, but you have nothing to do with Coachella. You don't know the bands. You don't know anything about it. And you just aren't the right fit. Then don't be there. And that's okay. You don't need to be everywhere, you know, anywhere and any everywhere. So I think that that's, again, goes back to us as content creators, may, working with partners and wanting to work with partners that really know their brand inside and out and also saying, you know what? I don't think this is the right platform for you, or I don't think this is the right experience for you. I don't believe that VR is actually the right experience for your audience because they're just not there. Or an NFT, you know what, probably isn't the best place to be. And that's the hard truth about, you know, being, you know, being a partner with brands in content creation because we have to have the hard truth not only executing to excellence, but having those hard conversations of just saying, you know what, it's going to get sniffed out. Yeah, I totally agree. In summary, it's like you, nobody can be all things to all people. And nor should you, unless you're Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to touch on the creative process for a second. Uh, you both are playing really pivotal roles at the mill in, in the evolving creative offering. And when I started in the industry, uh, which was about 10 years ago, uh, there was a very clear delineation between the role of a brand, agency, production company, post house, everything funneled through the same line. Um, and it really seems in recent years, uh, I've seen this particularly at the mill, but in many companies, the creative process is a lot more fluid now. Uh, can you speak to that a little? Angelo, why don't you kick us off? Absolutely. I, I think it just goes back to the, what we've been talking about at scale. I think that there's just too much volume out there. There's just too much work out there that a one, one brand, one agency are able to crack the code enough. Um, and I think that where where clients have have brought work internally, they're saying, oh my Lord, Look how big we have to grow in order to service all those needs. And I think an ad agency in their um, pipeline isn't necessarily equipped to execute. I think they're very equipped for strategy and for creative ideation, but to get the level of scale that we need to achieve these days, it's just not in their model. Whether it will become or not, who knows? I, I, I'm, you know. I, I don't think it's probably the best model for them. I think they should s stick really to strategy and creative, which they're fantastic at. Um, but I think that it really is, goes back to that volume conversation, which then goes back to if you're going to have other people ch execute your content for you, whether it be an ad agency or us, the mill, content creators or influencers, a master brand Bible is imperative to ensure that you're showing up the right way in the right voice to all that because i just think again it's it's going the, the amount of content that is going to be needed to service everything in and in the right way 
um, it, it's going to be too much for, say, the traditional brand trying to bring it internally and or an ad agency trying to ad hoc it with various different content creation partners, in my opinion. I totally agree. And I think there is definitely a there's I, I feel like there's always going to be a place for the agencies to come up with the big campaign idea. But it's how that big campaign idea is translated across all the digital social touch points, right? Especially when there are lots of YouTube channels and platforms that are that are that are coming up. There is very much also an, a need to intricately understand the functionality um, and tools that go with all of these um, all these different platforms and channels. And for for a production company like The Mill to be on the forefront of you know, working directly with a lot of the big tech companies and gaming companies and partner with them to be on the front line of creating content when these new tools and updates are released, then we can then feed that into the content that we're creating for the brands as well. And staying on top of the technology too, as, as well, you know, staying on top of this emerging tech is, is timely and, you know, we're in that space so that we can do it so that they don't have to do it because it is changing, you know, weekly. So. Yeah. I, when I first started at the mill in 2012, um, we were really strictly a post house and now have an experience arm and over 40 rostered directors. And it's really interesting to see the career path of, of a lot of those directors because they have a fluency in technology and they have a fluency in the digital arts, which is why they are able to move in the, to the directorial space because that's what brands require right now. It's that fluency in game engine technology and the technology that powers the uh, emerging concept of the metaverse. And um, exactly some of those directors have a really rich history as um, CGI artists. And so there definitely feels like an appetite to work closer and closer with the creators of your content uh, without so many layers in between because they have that command of the technology um, that that is essentially creating the content of the future. I agree with you 100%, Izzy, and I think that the reason where our directors come to play is that they're so immersed, engaged, and in love and in awe with the technology, which VFX is the foundation for a lot of this emerging tech. And I think that where they're different than say traditional live action versus this new world where we're at is because they understand the language and how to use that technology and how to speak that language in a way that others can't. Now, again, not saying that live action directors can't, but that's why with live action directors, there's always the VFX supervisor. With the VFX supervisor, then you go into the traditional VFX pipeline. But with our directors who came up through the VFX pipeline can speak both languages, which is so important knowing where we're going with Web 3.0 into the metaverse, um, which I, I believe that they're truly set up for this evolution of the new content creation um, which we're heading towards. Liz? And I, and I think also the fact that they are, that they are actually not employed directly by the brand. So they, you know, working on different brands and are able to bring a fresh pair of eyes into, especially if it's quite a tech heavy company. Um, to be able to elevate the messaging, create a really great story around it, um, and, and then create that content out for all those different channels and platforms. 
to be able to have that kind of fresh pair of eyes and experience is, is incredibly valuable, especially if you, you know, you, you, you might not be the kind of biggest sexy, you might not be the se- it might not be the sexiest tech brand, but we can take that apart and put it back together in a really interesting way that they may not have been able to do in house when they're so close to it. Agree. I think that that's really important as well to have that fresh perspective when you're in house and or you're just working on one brand per se to come to a place that actually is is more versed um, and and seeing what is going on and what are the trends outside of your community that could potentially apply to your community. So, yeah, I agree. Angelo, you touched on the metaverse, buzzword of the year. Um, I think the mill specifically is so well placed to start playing in this space because fundamentally that digital images, CGI, uh, real-time pipelines and worlds is is the foundation of what the metaverse will be built on and what these experiences are built on, which, like you said, is it's the language of VFX that we've been working on since 1990. Um, There are people who love the concept of the metaverse. There are people who hate it. It's a little bit scary. What do you think about brands in the metaverse? Should they be occupying this space? And, And what are the opportunities here and the key things they really need to take into account? So I'll start, and Liz, you're definitely a lot more (laughs) versed in this. I think buyer beware. You know, I think, again, be authentic to yourself. It doesn't mean you won't be in the metaverse at some point, but maybe you don't need to be a pioneer in it. Um, You know, to even, you know, just peel back one layer, and it's like with the metaverse, it's like if you think what – Marshmallow and I think it was I forgot who else with Epic and with um, uh, Fortnite you know there's authentic ways to be in a virtual world and it doesn't always have to just be careful because that was authentic it was smart it was creative it doesn't mean that you know if you're toilet paper Nothing against toilet paper, but maybe you don't need to be there right now until an NFT attaches to, you know, the metaverse where your toilet paper is 20 tokens and it's the most creative toilet paper in the world. I don't know. Like, but just I don't it goes back to what we were saying earlier about you don't need to be the first one in there and it doesn't mean you won't, but be authentic to who you are. And if you are in there show up the right way. Um, But Liz, this is all you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, look, so we've been in this space for a while, right? We've had VR, AR, XR, et cetera, et cetera. These, we've been, we've been in, on the, in the digital space for a long time. And the, 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 the word, the, 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 the name metaverse has just kind of wrapped everything up in a bow because it is, you know, I guess we need a name for it because it is going to become a bigger part of what we, you know, what we do and how we interact with each other, with brands, how we shop, how we, how we celebrate, how we go watch concerts, you know, but, but it's this, it's not like there was no metaverse before it, it's like, it, it, it's just been, it's just been developing and developing. So yeah, Angelo, I totally agree with you. It's the same as, it's the same as any other platform. It's like, do, are your audience in there? Where are they? And what are your opportunities to show up? both doing something physically in real life and or having having a virtual presence. Um, I think, you know, with Facebook changing its name to Meta um, for good or for bad, there's, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion around it. But I don't think and, and I but I feel like it's also that the mill has to has its own point of view. And, and I think it's important because there's no like one set line on what the metaverse is because it's changing all the time. Right. So. 
We are very well versed, exactly as you said, um, Angelo, because of the nature of how we've grown up as a production company with absolutely kind of world class VFX, CGI specialists, etc. Um, and therefore, we're you know very well placed to to help brands enter to help brands in, enter into this space. And um, with the advancements of real time and things like that, like we are. There's a, just as an example, like, there seems to be kind of an increasingly huge opportunity with, um, with like avatars and mascots as well. Like this is a digression for a minute, but it's kind of cool. Like we've got these motion capture suits, um, which XM we can, suits. Yeah, 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 that's it. You got it. That yeah, we can send suits. all around the world. And then yeah. we can have like, you know, we can have like a Tony the Tiger from I know in England it's Frosties I think it's Frosted Flakes it, here this is yeah. exactly. yeah doing a live interview with Stephen Colbert on the Late Show and that's nuts to me and it's like there's not many brands that have kind of taken advantage of that so far but that's super cool and then once you've got that then once you've got that that avatar then you can reuse that in all of your content whether that's within or, or you know within or, 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 or outside of the metaverse things like that like blow my mind I love the fact that we are you know embracing this change being at the forefront of it and 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 really exciting people so yeah i mean that's a digression from the overarching metaverse but i thought i'd add that in i i love that point liz oh, i think it's an interesting point in again the metaverse is one thing but be a, but being able to show up in the metaverse in real life and in different and you know in traditional and in these platforms and telling the story and a journey through all these different you know ways to tell a story is amazing and i think that the beauty about us is we are set up for that and we can do that because we have those thinkers who are thinking in all those spaces from traditional you know film to exactly this experiential in real in real life with you know vr capabilities and everything in between so it, i'm excited to get back to what you were saying is i'm excited about the metaverse i don't think everybody needs to be in it but there's ways to be in different touch points at it along the way to get you into eventually a full virtual world if that's where we all become because we become afraid to touch anything. I <laughs> just never love... gonna leave our houses again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'd um I'd love to go back to your point on virtual characters and avatars, Liz. I have seen the XN suit in action and it's just super cool and I remember when we first started using that to generate uh, real time character content, uh someone was asking me what would you do with this? And I said, Okay, well Think of one of the biggest advertising moments of the year, Super Bowl. Maybe you've got your 30 second ad playing out, but if you're a brand that has a very uh, famous character or mascot, let's take Tony the Tiger for an example, imagine if you had the technology to generate content on the fly live with that character, interviewing the players when they won, or talking to the yeah. commentators at halftime, or yeah. um, tweeting live content about every play in reaction. So there are so many interesting creative opportunities. I love the proliferation of real time uh, production. Absolutely, and it's taking that mascot, quote unquote, like let's say the Burger King guy or say Ronald McDonald, who were quote unquote mascots and now putting him in a virtual world that now you can get a lot more experiences from them in this new technology in new ways that you wouldn't have necessarily been able to do um, in the past. And again, going into you know that metaverse and this augmented reality, this virtual reality, and putting your characters in there in that new way, you know we have the artists to help create that and set that up and and get you into all those things. Um, you know the XN suits isn't bespoke just to us, by the way. You know it, it is a um, a tool that various other um, you know, companies and video game companies and people use, 
But I think that the way that we think about that technology and we can help brands utilize that technology in ways that they might not have is why um, we're positioned in this unique way for the metaverse. Well, before we wrap up, I would love to finish with a quick fire question for you both. Looking to the future, metaverse aside, what trends are you predicting for the next two years? So I'll go first on this one. Um, I have I have two. Uh, one is uh, a graveyard full of really bad NFTs that have been created <laughs> by uh, people who feel that they need to jump on board the um, NFT bandwagon. So obviously, if it's going on the blockchain, it's going to last forever. It is not a piece of content that you can just take down off the internet. So just be aware. <laughs> a, a word of warning. Um, and the other one, I think, is um, sh uh, shoppability. Like everything, you you're going to be able to buy things in places that you never thought that you would be able to buy things before. I think brands are going to make it easier and easier. And the platforms I know are, um, are, are kind of running a lot of um, new ways um, in which you can buy um buy things um, and I think you know ranging from uh, making Instagram more shoppable through to shopping in game in the metaverse um, is going to be you know on the on the up and up you know we talk about uh, communicating in the right way with people where they are but if you can then communicate with them engage with them and then drive them through to buy something um, with very very few touch points it's not like you now have to you know click on something then go through to an external website or whatever it's like everything it, it, it's just so at your fingertips and so easy so uh, I think that that's going to be a, a really big trend. Well, I'm already a total sucker for Instagram ads, so it looks like I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to probably, in the next two years, it's two things. I think IRL and virtual are going to combine more and more, and we're mm -hmm. going to see more and more of those experiences. And I think 4.3 is coming back, baby. I think 4.3 center cut, and you're going to see a lot more cropping, and we're going old school so we're going uh, vintage 80s are back we're going vintage nice well thank you both so much for joining me today i've really enjoyed our discussion and we'll chat soon thank you thank you so much izzy if you're interested in exploring any of the ideas you heard today please get in touch with the technical creative studios team via any one of our studio websites or email beyond imagination at technicolor.com Today's podcast was produced by Lime Studios, led by executive producer Becca Falborn. You can follow Lime Studios on all platforms at limestudios.tv. Thank you to all of our guests and to you for tuning in to Beyond Imagination.